Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. This year's Catalyzing Change Week is about solutions from the front line by social innovators. In 2022, Catalyst 2030 concentrated its efforts on bringing proximate leaders and frontline solutions to the forefront. Collaborations led by members from the Global South produce groundbreaking reports on climate and transforming education, with an emphasis on offering local solutions. We continued our mission to create an enabling environment for social entrepreneurs to flourish by initiating a letter to donors signed by more than 1,200 social entrepreneurs and innovators. The Catalyst 2030 awards ceremony was spectacular and the awards themselves welcomed by the private sector, governments, biomultilaterals and donors. Catalyst 2030 as a movement is disruptive. One of the best things I think that's come out of Catalyst 2030 so far um, is incredible collaboration across the ecosystem that just didn't exist before Catalyst came into being. The thing I love most about Catalyst is that it's an open movement for social entrepreneurs around the world. I'd encourage anyone who's uh, looking to be more connected with their local communities around social development goals to come along to Catalyze and Change Week. Welcome to Catalyzing Change Week. All right, thank you so much, Brian, for sharing that. And I guess it's over to me. I'm going to share my screen now. Just one moment, and then I definitely need everyone to confirm that you can see my screen. So, can you all see my screen? Just check in. Okay, great. All right, so once again, I'd love to introduce myself. My name is Vitemi Adetere. I am the communications manager here at Giving Tuesday Africa Hub, and I will be moderating this session. Today, we will be talking about, a moment, please. Today, we have amazing guests that will be sharing their thoughts around giving generosity i mean before we get started i would love each and every one of us to share what you think what giving or generosity means to you right so if you can go right into the comment section tell us what generosity means to you while i introduce our amazing speakers today today we will be talking about catalyzing and transforming change through generosity and this is the one hour session all right so by way of introduction, I would love to introduce our guest. First, we have Suzanne Odongo. She is a philanthropy expert. <coughs> we have Frank Aswani, who is the CEO of Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance. And we have Priyanka Duck. She is the chief advisor of Giving Tuesday India Hub. So at this point, <coughs> I'm going to hand over the mic to Susan, who is going to talk a bit more about herself and she will touch on the topic for today. Then we move to Frank, and then we move to Priyanka. Susan, are you ready? Yes, I am. I hope I can be heard. Yes, you can. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. As shared, my name is Susan Jambio Dongo, and I work as a philanthropy knowledge developer. My work focuses on around how to support um, local organizations to be able to use the resources they have around them towards to bring bringing about social change. And I don't know whether uh, Venera will be breaking the rules. When you've asked people about generosity, I'm just curious to hear what people are coming up with. <laughs> um, and I think I just want to share that the perspective then I'll be bringing on board is just recognizing that when we talk about generosity is that we're looking at how do we bring the desired change in someone's life or community or their well-being. And one of the things in my practice is that it has been something that we are doing consciously and unconsciously. And my hope is today we can have a conversation of how do we do this collectively in a conscious manner to bring um, the long-term impact that we desire to see when we talk about social change. So I come on board as one who's worked a lot with um, local organizations and giving them an opportunity to be able to explore the potential they have 
um, using the generosity practices that they have at the local level and using that to bring about um, the change. But beyond that, it's not just about uplifting lives, but also demonstrating our humaneness and how best we can be able to grow that. And the key thing about this practice that I see is that it has moved from people just giving for everyday um, things to being a conscious process of supporting development agendas. And so as we have a conversation today, I'll seek to just share that perspective of how do we build that infrastructure that can help local communities to be able to be more effective, to be seen, to be heard, um, even as we explore and pursue the agenda of um, leaving no one behind, um, so to speak. So I look forward to our conversation today. Amazing, Susan. I mean, I'm also looking forward to how you, the expertise you're going to share around, you know, us touching more on grassroots organizations and community philanthropy. That's amazing. Um, Frank, I think you are up now. Would love to hear from you. Yeah, good evening. Thanks. I hope you can all hear me. Um, so to everyone, I'm Frank Aswani. I'm CEO of AVPA. We are a Pan-African network of social investors mobilizing uh, grants, debt, and equity into the impact space. And the problem we're trying to address at a macro level is how do we help Africa close its SDG financing gap? Because you all know SDGs is the framework that is commonly used and understood to track progress to a sustainable development. And at a micro level, we're trying to see how do we support the sustainable financing of grassroots or ground level uh, impact SMEs and initiatives. And those initiatives for me is not just uh, for profit, but also non-profit organizations. Um, I think the, the whole issue about catalyzing change and the whole aspect of generosity. So first of all, from my perspective, when I talk up, when I think about generosity and giving, uh, I work around the three T's of giving, treasure, time, and talent. We all lose, tend to focus only on money, on the treasure bit, but there's a lot of things in this world that can be sold by just by our expertise and by our time. So I try not to narrow myself too much into it all being about money, uh, although that is the major uh, need uh, and lens when you talk about generosity. But let's not also forget that the time and talent as well as uh, as a key parts of, of what we require to build uh, sustainable impact and development uh, in our spaces. So, um, and, and I think it's very important when we talk about catalyzing change. Uh, and, and for me, when I was thinking about the topic about Catalyzing Change Week is, is the backdrop of this is the fact that the change you require and the problems we have to solve are a lot bigger than the resources we have. And how do we then make sure that the resources we, we possess and that we currently have in our hands or in our circles of influence are catalytic, that they are here to, to light bigger fires than we can, we can, we can find on our own. Uh, we should be thinking about how do we become those fire starters and firecrackers that then go on to, to create huge bellows of smoke and flame that uh, drive the change you require. And so catalyzing and catalytic uh, thinking is a very important part of what I think we all have to be thinking of doing. And I'll speak to a bit more about that and how I feel, um, especially philanthropy can be a lot more catalytic going forward. Uh, but thank you for having me on, on, this, on this discussion. Thank you so much, Frank. You mentioned how um, a lot of people think generosity is about money, but it's most times not about money. I mean, one time I helped someone with his LinkedIn profile. So I'm just sharing like an, uh, an icebreaker, right? And it turns out that that was a huge help, CV and LinkedIn, and he got a tech role, right? And I was so happy. And I even forgot that I had help, you know, with his CV, with his LinkedIn profile. And he came back with so much excitement telling me how I made this happen. So this is generosity for me. It's a way of life. I always seek out ways to help people. And while we are talking about this and while everyone is, you know, introducing themselves in the chat, please also tell us what generosity means to you. I'm interested in that because that is content for me, really. So um, Priyanka is the Chief Advisor of Giving Tuesday India Health. And I really consider this as a huge honor having her here. She's going to talk a lot more 
um, and really usher us into our conversation today. Priyanka, over to you. Thank you so much, Bidemi. And it's my entirely my honor to be here. It's just, it's so wonderful to be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to take advantage of the full six minutes you've given us, Bidemi, if I may. And could I share my screen and a few slides? I just want to take you through some photographs of people that I want to talk to you about. Frank, I love the phrase that you used, the, the word about, you know, the, you, you talked about fire starters. And I think that's really at the heart of who we are and what we do with Giving Tuesday. Give me a second while I share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Perfect. So this is Warda. Warda is 22 years old. She lives in Pakistan. She's a social activist. She's a researcher. She's an aspiring lawyer. And she's the founder of a social enterprise that envisions a world where every human being has equitable access to food, shelter, and education. And that thought came to her because she believes that education was her key to escaping poverty. And today she's dedicated her life to creating employable skills among young people and connecting them with relevant jobs. And she calls that her life's mission. Varda is also a Giving Tuesday Starling Fellow. Across the globe, Jade, oops, where are we? There we go. This is Jaden. Jaden is now 14, but he started his generosity journey when he was eight. And his generosity journey is about spreading kindness around the world. At 14, he's now the founder of a nonprofit called From the Bottom of My Heart. And his mission is about rallying support for those in need when disaster or crisis strikes. So whether it's distributing food and water and clothes to those affected by hurricanes, or shipping first aid kits and essential supplies like toothbrushes and toothpaste and vitamins to people living through war in Ukraine, or even closer to home, providing laptops to his school so that students who didn't have access to personal computers could continue to remain home and learn through the COVID-19 pandemic. Jaden's focus is purely on rallying his community and to give back in as many ways as possible to those in need. He has a beautiful sort of mission in life because he reflects on his work and he says, giving is the best thing to do and giving is the right thing to do. And then there's Tuesdays for Trash. This is a globally distributed grassroots environmental movement, which celebrates Giving Tuesday as a way to bring together people from around the world who care about just a cleaner and healthier future. So co-founders Wanda and Sharona created a simple way for people everywhere to practice this journalism, this, this activism, by simply picking up trash. These are leaders who are part of this amazing global network at Giving Tuesday that seeks to grow generosity around the world. I'm going to pause there. Bidemi, were you making signals at me? No, no, no. Um, you, you can continue. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, Giving Tuesday, for those who don't know, is a global movement, and it's based on a simple idea. Everyone, everywhere has something to give, and every act of generosity counts. And Giving Tuesday is created by this network of distributed leaders like Varda and Jaden and Wanda and Sharona, who raise their hands and step forward to lead Giving Tuesday in now over 90 countries and hundreds of communities. And while these leaders come from all walks of life, they're bound by one shared vision. There's a deep commitment to bringing community together, whatever community might mean to them, and to growing generosity in their communities as a way of creating positive social change. Now, these distributed leaders are co-owners of the movement. They're people who create the movement every single day in their own individual contexts. And they all act with the autonomy to create Giving Tuesday. Oops, sorry. There we go. To create Giving Tuesday in a way that speaks to their specific context and their communities. And what that means is that the movement and generosity is truly inclusive and every voice matters. It means that the things that happen are more creative, they're more generative, imagination and skills are unlimited, and everyone everywhere has a stake in that work. And what that then leads to is truly unique things that happen at an individual level, but also the joy of being unified under a shared vision. Now, great way that this shows up in the Giving Tuesday world is what we call unbranding. 
And this is an example of how the Giving Tuesday heart has shown up in all of our different country movements with the heart being personalized to whatever that country movement feels is relevant to them. No one told those leaders that they needed to use the heart. And yet that heart demonstrates how Giving Tuesday leaders are deeply interconnected with each other. And that extends to sharing strategies and ideas and inspiration and learning, even though they're all focused on their individual communities and their contexts. And when they're all this deeply connected to each other, that leads to collective action. Even if the, connect, the action is hyper-local, this unifying vision where people are connected at this global scale means that they're experiencing this joy of participating in something much bigger than themselves. They're not working or dreaming in isolation. And it is that understanding that every small action and connection contributes to creating complex systems in the world, systems that constitute the patterns of our society. And when we understand our work as part of this larger system, it forms the basis for us to build collective strategies, tactics, and tools that make this change happen. Now, we've seen, and I think everybody on this call can, can attest to that, that we've seen small actions that create this ripple effect that spreads outwards. And when communities abound with generosity, we've seen that it's possible to unlock all sorts of beautiful things, dignity, opportunity, equity. And just as Frank said, the joy of generosity can be experienced in many ways. You can experience it by giving time, treasure, talent, and testimony. And it's a way, it's an approach to life rather than a transaction or an action alone. With that, I'm going to hand back to you, Pidemi. Thank you so much, Priyanka. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think I'm just going to reach out to Frank so he can also share some examples as to how generosity has been causing change, um, you know, from his own perspective. Frank? Yeah, uh, thank you, Bidemi. I, I, um, I think especially as Africans, uh, uh, generosity is really at the core of, of who we are. Um, if you think about uh if i quickly go around the room today i'm sure everyone here is probably paying school fees for someone's child or cousin or a relative uh and that's really at the core of who we who defines us as a unique people uh the fact that we deeply care about each other and even the little that we don't have we 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 share and we help others uh you know uh, in in the in addressing the issue that they're facing I was totally surprised. Uh, uh, this is an, an unconfirmed fact, but to to hear that even to churches, for example, uh, Africans give a lot of money to churches and mosques, wow. and uh, and uh, and you you look at even things like uh, uh, diaspora remittances and giving a lot of that money that comes back from our brothers and sisters living abroad is really towards helping families back home. So generosity is really at the core of who we are. We've also been beneficiaries of generosity. Uh, to a great extent. If you look at the history of Africa and the development we've, we've gone through, a lot of that has been driven by aid, for example, which is, has come through generosity of, uh, uh, of other, other countries. And, uh, and uh, that has uh, potentially helped us make some strong strides in progress and some of the impact space. Now, the challenge you have generosity that comes from outside and not from within is that it it's, doesn't come with any obligations to be there for life. And uh, you can't always depend on it for sustainable uh, um, growth and development. You've got to be thinking about the risk associated of sometimes this uh, generosity drying up. And we've seen that, we've seen aid to Africa reduce quite significantly in the last couple of years. I think in countries like Southern Africa, about 30% reduction in the last uh, six to eight years. And uh, we saw Trump cut aid, USAID funding, uh, the UK government has done the same. So even as Africans, we've got to start thinking a bit differently about not being over-reliant on uh, generosity from outside, but trying to see how we can cultivate generosity from within. Uh, but make sure that uh, the kind of uh, uh, culture and people and systems that we're creating on the continent are not too dependent, especially on the cash generosity of others. So how do we then use some of the money that we're getting in a catalytic manner that builds sustainable development for, for our people that then reduces the need for, for things like grant generosity from other people. And I think this is where we start seeing the, the evolving role of philanthropy today compared to what it was a couple of years ago um, when, uh, when you know, there was a lot of grant capital flying around 
And uh, today we are overwhelmed by the amount of challenges we face compared to the amount of capital, for example, that's available. And so we're seeing increasingly um, uh, the solution that we require to solve our problem in the long run uh, have to be thinking about catalyzing, using the catalytic impact of the capital and the money that we're getting uh, uh, coming through our, our, our friends and, and uh, networks overseas towards sustainable impact. And that means, uh, are we using our money and some of this aid that's coming, for example, to test new markets, new products, new services that, that would be self-sustaining on their own, in essence, uh, where solutions uh, are required, we don't necessarily have to think about these solutions as being grant dependent for life. There are some solutions that have uh, uh, ability to generate revenue and sustain themselves. And that's why we need to think about how do we use the money catalytically uh, in, in solving some of our problems. So I know I come from a, a bit of a different lens, but um, uh, my approach is very much that uh, we have some headwinds coming in our direction. Um, how do we do that? But as we grow local generosity uh, uh, from the wealth we're creating, we need to think differently about how we use that money for more sustainable impact and also how to do that, how do we bring in more private sector players into this space? Because they have a lot more money than we do have in the development space. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, Susan, I, I want to come to you with a question. Um, Frank talked about how um, you know it would be great if we are not grant reliant. As someone who works with local organizations and communities. Um, do you have some examples that you can share with us of community organizations that are thriving, you know, irrespective of age that comes into the continent? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And um, I, I really want to pick where Frank has left off, um, just as I begin to respond to your question is that, I think for the longest time we have focused on generosity from an outward perspective and the fact that we have depended a lot on external um, generosity mm -hmm. and increasingly um, the social challenges, um, the changes in socioeconomic dynamics have really influenced um, the continued demand for us to begin to look for alternative approaches to be able to look at how best we appreciate um, generosity around us. And so there's been a lot of introspection that has been happening. And this is where my studies around local giving have demonstrated that, um, as, as um, Frank has ably said, our cultures have really encouraged generosity and giving as a practice. But as I shared earlier, it's a practice that has seen um, us focusing on immediate needs. But over time, what has happened is that we have seen communities begin to recognize that addressing immediate needs is not enough. There's a growing need to begin to look at how do you bring sustainable solutions to the work we are doing? And so in that sense, then we began to see communities rally around um, one another, building entities or initiatives that help them to be able to push um, certain agendas around bringing social change. And just to highlight some of them, we've seen communities coming together and recognizing the fact that they have an interest in educating their children, but the education facilities, infrastructures are quite a distance from them. This is something that we have seen um, in uh, Kenya, in the Maasai land, where these communities have been able to come together and have been able to bring together the resources they have. Now, this community depend on livestock and therefore they've been able to use market days to sell the livestock. And what they have done is they've used that money as capital to actually initiate and begin to develop um, uh, the local education facilities. We've had communities where they have recognized that they have persons with disabilities um, children with disabilities amongst them, and they are struggling to use the sanitation facilities that exist within the grassroots communities. And so what they have done is they have come together with a local um, organization, and this in, is in Morogoro in Tanzania, and have been able to come together with the community. And initially what happened is this group of, of um, uh, community group actually began the process by doing what we always do, writing a proposal, uh, putting it out there, but we challenged them. And this is the work we did with uh, the Foundation for Civil Society is that we challenged them and asked, how do you begin to appreciate the giving and the resourcing that's around you? And they actually translated that uh, money into in-kind giving 
And it is amazing because now they're in the process of actually developing um, sanitation facilities and have been able to get a long-term community member to be able to uh, support with cement and things like this. So you begin to see that there is need to recognize that at the local level, people do know what the challenges are and have the capability of innovating and catalyzing the change within themselves. They are able to recognize that they have a role in responding um, to social development. And so my challenge to us who are development actors is how well are we engaging communities? They are no longer seeing their role as recipients of development, but rather they recognize that they do have a role to be change makers and therefore need to be incorporated as core investors, as core developers, as we design some of these initiatives that we are thinking about to be able to bring long-term change. The ability to do that and to bring that is to ensure that we have community within and at the center of that, um, so to speak. And so those are some of the examples I can be able to share. And it's just to mention that increasingly now in my work, we're beginning to recognize that local resource mobilization is beginning to gain traction as a key way for us to be able to look at bringing our internal expertise, our abilities to raise these resources locally and to grow that, um, so to speak. But the biggest challenge we have is being able to address the gap of the existing development infrastructure that has a very strong focus on external support, but has no strong frameworks to support um, these local initiatives that exist to be able to catalyze the change that we want to see in the long term. Oh my God, Susan, <laughs> I've been writing and writing. That's amazing. Um, um, so, I, I mean, let, let me just speak on one thing you talked about. How well can we engage these communities and see them as co-investors? I would like to see how well can we see them as people we can co-create the solutions with. Um, Priyanka, would you like to speak to, you know, co-creation? Because I know you touched on this collective action. How well do you think we can begin to engage communities and see them as partners rather than beneficiaries, if permit me to use that word? <laughs> and I think that's part of where a, a lot of the problem lies, right, with the, the social sector is that we think of, of communities as beneficiaries. One of the things that you know, I've, I've spent most of my career in the social sector as a practitioner um, and I, I joined Giving Tuesday last year. And one of the things that really, really spoke to me about Giving Tuesday and about the Giving Tuesday values is the way that Giving Tuesday thinks about equity. You know, in the social sector, equity is a big thing, right? Every proposal you write, you're thinking about equity and you're, you're sort of speaking to how your project is going to address equity. The way Giving Tuesday thinks about equity is that everybody is a giver and everybody is a receiver, and every act of generosity counts. And it doesn't matter if you're not a millionaire, what you have to give is important and meaningful. And that just, I think, shifts entirely the way you think about power and the way you think about community and the way you think about where solutions come from and where change is driven from. And I think you're, you're you know, both Frank and Susan, you talked about, um, you know, how international aid agendas have, and they are agendas that have driven how you actually create change in countries and continents. And as that money is changing and it's shifting, what, where does that leave us? And I think that's really where co-creation and co-ownership by communities is fundamental because it's time for communities to set the agenda. It's time for communities to be focused on the, the issues that are most important to themselves and to be thinking about the solutions that they can actually invest in and support and grow. And that's where sustainability comes from as well. That's what people care about. It's those problems to them and thinking about the solutions that they want to create for that. So that's that's what I would that's where I would sort of really focus my attention. Is how do you shift the power? Hmm. Thank you so much, Priyanka. I'm, I'm learning so much. I'm definitely going to listen to this recording again. And um, before we continue, I would like to um, inform everyone that we, we would love to hear your thoughts and feedback about how you know this session is going. So please take a moment to fill our form. I just fixed it in the chat section. And we would love to hear what you think about 
um, this session. I'm also going to go through the chats just to see if we've missed any comments. Um, okay. I can see I'm recognizing everyone here. Okay, so Bravils, Kogala says, I'm more interested in local philanthropy, generosity, a model of generosity in which members of local communities give towards, I mean, we've touched on this, towards the development of their own communities. Bravils, I, ho I hope that we've touched on this. If there's something else you would like us to talk about, please let us know. Um, I'm also looking at, okay, have communities at the center from the conceptualization to implementation of all interventions. I mean, I agree with this, but do, does any one of us have uh, a comment? Would you like to speak to this, Frank or Susan or Priyanka? Having communities at the center from, I think, Susan. It's dangerous to throw comments and then they're thrown back at you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's it's. I think for me the critical question I keep bringing up um, as part of my reflective process is how how do we do this? Because we always assume that this is a platform, and and I and I feel this is some of the challenges that I I, I normally bring to the table of development actors when they say, oh, the SDG agenda is here. We said everyone should everyone should move, everyone should be left behind. So why aren't they in this space? I think for me the first thing we need to understand is one. We need to recognize that there's need to change the mindset of how we do things. I had an opportunity to talk to, um, uh, in, in my work on looking at how to strengthen um, alternatives for resourcing uh, for civil society in Tanzania. And we were looking at homegrown solutions as part of that. And it was interesting to talk to um, a person who has been working in the disability sector. And one of the things he said is, as development actors, even when we want to talk about social inclusion, our attitude towards that is with the perspective of, tell us what the problem is and we will give you the solution. Very, very prescriptive. We do not accept to be vulnerable to communities and to the different actors that we want to engage at the local level and say, look, this is what we are thinking of doing. We don't know how to do it. Come on board, help us to understand how best we can partner with you and support you to bring the change you want to bring. So the first thing is how vulnerable are we to allow the community to be able to come into the spaces that we have occupied and take a step back so that then they have an opportunity to one, risk it, two, learn, but three, grow. Because one of the things that we have as a challenge is we have not created a space for capacities and competencies to grow within um, our homegrown community, so to speak. And in that sense, then we create a pathway of not just saying, here is space, this voice, is actually helping them to hear themselves, to understand the space and to see how best to sit in the space. Now, will that be a day? No, social change does not happen in a day. It happens over a duration of time. And therefore we need to make sure that we are creating the infrastructure that can help that to be able to happen, um, so to speak. Two is that we also need to acknowledge that they, as a community, are looking for partnership and they need to be allowed to decide who to partner with. Don't assume that communities want to partner with you just because you have the currency. And I like what we started with, is that we need to recognize generosity is not just about currency. We are trying to build trust for long-term change. So how do we then create those spaces that allows the community to be able to determine that for them, this is who they would like to partner with for the work to continue. And in that sense, we begin the process of not just saying putting community at the center of it, but demonstrating it in everything that we do, right? So my long answer to that short um, response, so to speak, I think we need to so dig much. a little bit deeper on that center word. <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I'm, I'm still going through some of the comments. Fully agree, Frank. I think this is from Dinat. I too believe time are talent and talent, rather, are equally Im important potential source of change and impact. Okay, okay. I think I can go back to the slides now. 
Okay, someone has touched on mindset, which Susan has also touched on. And sustainability and co-creation are inseparable from collective power. Priyanka, would you like to speak to that comment? It's so interesting. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a little bit more personal, if I may. Um, okay. The India Hub is uh, in the middle of a co-creation process. One of the things that we I talked about the Starling uh, Fellowship, and I talked about how Varda is a Starling Fellow, and Starling is a global fellowship that is run by Giving Tuesday, and it invests in grassroots change makers and grassroots change leaders who may not otherwise have access to those resources that abound around learning and fellowship. Um, we've been thinking about what it's going to take to create an Indian version of Starling. And obviously with, you know, the first thing is language and sort of making it contextual. And we decided that we were going to adopt Giving Tuesdays core value around co-creation and co-ownership in bringing Starling to India. So what we're doing is we've partnered with five other organizations who already work with grassroots communities. A lot of them work with women and girls. And we're working with them to collaboratively create Starling for India. Now, what that means is we're all bringing resources to the table. We're all bringing something that we have and we're looking at how best do we use these resources. And we're bringing as well the lens at this point so far, at least the lens of what do we understand about our communities and what do we not understand about our communities or that we know we don't understand about our communities that we then need to be able to shape as we go forward. And we're thinking very much about how do you make sure that what you're creating is of most value to those communities. That's been such an interesting pro process because we're talking about a wide range of demographics. You're talking about, you know, adolescent girls, but you're also talking about, you know, middle-aged women who are in positions of political power, but at a at a you know in a rural context where power is an incredibly murky thing. And you've got this wide range of something as simple as digital access and digital use ability. And we're thinking about how do you create something that means that you're, you know, you're co-creating it, but you've also got to make sure that it is something that can be used by everybody, that it creates this long-term impact where the, the fellows that we invest in now become champions within their own communities. It's the more the, it's like a thread when you start to think about sustainability, co-creation, collective power, you realize that you can't have one without the other. And they're all completely interwoven, um, you know, in this way that means that you've got to, we found that we've got to be able to just surrender in some ways to the fact that things will go in directions that we can't foresee and that we can't predict and we can't control. And we've got to be okay with that. So it's, it's an incredible journey, but it is so rewarding. Sorry, that was a little bit of a personal. <laughs> <laughs> I actually loved it, Priyanka. I mean, I, I've learned a lot, a lot rather, knowing fully well that, you know, the India Hub is doing amazing, by the way. I, I would like to, you know, speak to Frank. Uh, it's, it's funny how we are not using the slides at the moment, but at least one question from our slides, please. Um, imagine trends. I would love that you touch on this. What trends can we see that, you know, you can see, you see, this is something that is happening. And I would lo love that, you know, development actors, you know, really look into this trend um, in terms of catalyzing change. Yeah, I, th I think we're seeing uh, some of the trends that have been mentioned by uh, both Susan and, and Priyanka. Uh, we're seeing a lot more deliberate um, action around making sure communities are at the center of decision making around uh, uh, around resource mobilization and deployment. Uh, because don't forget that without the community, there's no philanthropist. There's just someone with money. Uh, and and let's, not, let's not take that power away from the community. You offer the philanthropist an opportunity to fulfill something inside him that he longs for. Uh, so you're not, you're not totally bringing nothing to the table you're bringing an opportunity for philanthropists to live his dream. So he must, he must be able to help you live yours as well in the process. So the, there is some power dynamics there that we've 
always assumed is too skewed towards the uh, the the owner of the resources, uh, and I think that that is changing. Number two, um, I think how we measure uh, impact uh, and sustainability is also driving uh, what we start to do in, from the very beginning. Because you know they always say start with the end in mind, and how you define your metrics is very important. That you have the voice of your of your of your of the person whose problem you're helping solve, uh, of your partner. Uh, uh, right in the core of of how you measure success. So, if at the end of your uh, of your relationship with this community, the community's voice doesn't come out strongly and give you five out of five, then something's not right. Uh, and that's something we've got to always consider. Uh, I, I think that's very very important. Uh, I think the other thing that we're seeing is, uh, uh, I mean, and if I look at how, because uh, about about 20% of my network are philanthropists, um, is also to try and see um, uh, how, how what's the changing role of philanthropy? Yes, there are certain things uh, that uh, philanthropy can very uniquely do in this world because of the nature of, uh, of how it is set up, the fact that it is, it's, uh, it's not, it's not uh, seeking any returns in terms of financial returns, it's, it has more appetite for risk. And how does philanthropy uh, then make a point of being able to take a lot more of that risk required to especially catalyze some early stage solutions um, and innovations, the kind of places where uh, more commercial capital will not go. So, so there's a huge need for what we're calling catalytic capital that is that is really has an appetite, is, is risk-seeking capital in essence. It's money that is quite happy to go where uh, solutions don't exist, and no one's willing to put in money, and to go and try and test new models and new and new solutions. Uh, so there are a lot of things uh, that I think uh, would not have been possible in the world without philanthropy. Uh, you look at uh, even uh, some big inventions were were catalyzed largely by by philanthropic capital. We are seeing a lot more of that coming in through blended structures to, in today's world. Uh, we are seeing philanthropists um, uh, being a lot more deliberate, recognizing that. They may not be able to build the solution to scale, but they can catalyze its 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 initial creation, uh, and so that emerging source of philanthropic partners, knowing that without them, uh, a lot of that risk required to, to create new in, invention and innovation do not happen. So those are some of the trends we are seeing. Thank you so much, Frank. I feel like we're supposed to have a whole session just on emerging trends. So we have like a few minutes to the end of today's session, and I would love to open up the floor for anyone who has questions or comments. 10 minutes, actually, guys. So if you have a question or you'd like to share a comment or you'd like to address one or two things our speakers here have shared with us, now is the time. Please raise your hand. Um, use any of the reactions here. Okay, I'm just looking through all of our participants right now to be sure. All right, so I think I'm just gonna continue. Okay, for some reason I can't find the chat section anymore. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you so much. Please do not forget to share your thoughts about this session. I would love to use this opportunity to thank Susan and Priyanka and Frank. We never truly met, we've not met really, and you have made this session amazing and I'm learning a lot. I mean, some of the terms here, I'm happy to just state them so we all kind of go back with these terms in our minds. We have words like sustainability, collective action, you know, distributed power, co-creation, um, community ownership, partnership. And in terms of trends, we've seen a lot more deliberate action, um, you know, measuring impact, blended structures. And I think I've heard from Frank how uh, philanthropists are creating sort of a launch pad, right, for um, these changes to be seen. Thank you once again, Frank. Thank you, Priyanka and Susan. I think we are about to come to the close of this session. I'm just going to look through the chat again, to be sure. And then I'm going to ask for one final request where we all take a selfie. So I send this back to my team and say we had an amazing, amazing session. But I think I need to change the view.
But then Someone, even while you're doing that, if I may just sort of respond a little bit, not respond, add to, I think, what Frank just said, because I, Frank, you're absolutely right. I think philanthropy is what has allowed for the social sector to take risk. And I think it, it feels almost like there's a, we're at a tipping point where somebody needs to be willing to take more risk when it comes to, to philanthropy and to resourcing to be able to invest in community-led change in a much more significant way than it has been so far. So it feels like that's the next frontier somehow. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are facing huge challenges ahead of us, which require new solutions. Uh, we can't be still be piggybacking on the old solutions. We are facing challenges that have been thrown to us uh, through the unintended consequences of technology, for example, and what it's doing to our kids. You know, all of those things uh, require for us to think differently. And, and without philanthropy, frankly, most of these things would not be of interest to other people to invest in, uh, in that context. Uh, but I think philanthropy comes in very critically uh, to help us really think through uh, um, how, how, we, how we test different approaches and experiment with a diff couple of different options to get to the most ideal solution. And, and in, in the context of that, it's just not the funding, but also developing the talent to do, to do the innovation. Uh, we know uh, talent is universal opportunity is not. There are a lot of very smart kids who, who got very good ideas, who will never get the opportunity to develop the ideas further without having someone who trusts who, and believes in them and put some early, early stage uh, financing in some of those things. So all of those kind of things are the kind of things I think uh, philanthropy has a really critical role to play. In fact, when you think about it, the world is not short of capital or money. We're short of risk money, risk capital. That's what we lack. Globally, we're not short of money. Uh, I mean, we, we need $4.3 trillion to, uh, to solve the, the SDG financing gap. The financial and capital markets are $430 trillion. We're not short of money. We're just short of risk capital. And allow me to add on to that, uh, Debbie, because then, one of the things now we are exploring is what is the value of generosity? Are we actually documenting that value? Because as it is right now, one of the things we are noting is even in the way we report SDGs, sadly, is the community or homegrown solutions taken into consideration. Why? Because they're seen as small efforts. They're seen as pilot projects. Yet, as Frank is saying, the value that they bring, they actually explore and bring out new innovative ways of responding to the social challenges we are facing. They bring new ways of helping us to understand how best we can be able to solve some of the problems. I love when, when we had the COVID outbreak, it actually forced us to think about homegrown solutions. And it was amazing, the pockets of where we were finding these solutions. It was not in the usual suspects that we have been seeing. It has actually come from communities, from countries that we hardly thought had the infrastructure for um, health, you know? And so for me, I want to challenge our thinking process even as we leave today is how are we ensuring that we're demonstrating the value of generosity in everything that we do? How are we documenting? And I want to appreciate um, giving Tuesday because you are creating that platform and giving those stories as vulnerably as they come. You know, there's no right, a great NGO language in it. It's actually simplifying it, demonstrating our failures, our successes, and our growth process, because that's what people need to know. They need to understand that social change is not going to happen overnight, but it needs us to appreciate the risk and the innovation that will come with it. If truly we want to catalyze the change we want to see, but beyond that, we also need to begin to ask ourselves, how best are we going to be able to ensure that even in our reporting mechanisms, and this is something that I'm challenging national governments, how are we actually reporting our homegrown solutions as we say we are achieving the SDGs? I think for me, that's an area we really need to explore further. Yeah, Bidemi, you, you, might, you might regret calling the three of us into a panel and never, never invite us again. <laughs> never invite us again. So, so, uh, so I, I, I beg for your forgiveness because I think she's got, she's got a really good point in there. Uh, and, and this is where it's so important for us to look at at mobilizing local generosity. Because local generosity understands local context and local problems. Mm. Only, only they see or have the, the, have the value to understand uh, the, the, the potential impacts these local bread solutions could have across a country, across a region. Because they've, they've seen the problem that people have lived who are now solving those problems. Uh, and it's, it's more, you, you have a high chance of having a local player uh, supporting that 
idea from as an idea stage to to a growth stage than someone from outside and and so part of the work i spent time doing is developing local investors how do we get more local capital and lock more local investors uh so who've got more local context and not keep depending on external capital and and players to come and solve that so i totally agree with you uh, and part of this is what people like you and i on this call should be looking to do and and the joy about being here with someone from india is in the global south we we, we are solving very similar problems in very similar economies uh, uh so sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel sometimes we just need to look at who's solving something similar in india and how do we replicate to accelerate that solution in africa as well and vice versa absolutely. you're absolutely right now i feel like there's there is something about I, I love that you're saying that you're focused on you know, galvanizing or catalyzing local uh, financing as well, because that's when sustainability will happen with the, with the financing as well, because it's local philanthropists and local capital that cares about local problems way more than somebody who's you know, yes. not connected to community. So yeah. when, you're, when you're that connected to community, it just changes the relationship entirely. But any, you've got to stop us, otherwise we will run away with this session um, even if we already have. I mean, oh my God, thank you, thank you so much. So I'm just put, putting this out there, Frank, I'm going to come back to you asking for a session, a podcast session. <laughs> Susan, no, 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 there's no way we are not doing this again. Thank you so much for making this happen. This has been the most interesting, to be honest, session I've ever you know, attended or moderated. Most times these development webinars, I do not understand them. This is the first time I'm understanding something so clearly, you know, so simple to understand and we kind of know what we want to do going forward. So thank you so much, Priyanka, Frank and Susan. With that, I'm not looking at the chat section. I'm not saying anything anymore. We are saying goodbye at this point. I would like to say thank you to Catherine and Emma for joining the Giving to the Africa Hub. She made this happen. So I really appreciate this. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Bye.